Control, ladies and gentlemen. Another October has rolled around, and with it, another World Series. Ready for play ball. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? We're at Wrigley Field in Chicago this afternoon for the third game of the World Series. Here is the great moment. The Yankees have come on the field. And the 1936 World Series is history. The first game of this historic 1948 World Series gets underway. Live and in color, it's 1969 World Series Baseball. The first night game in the history Good of the World Series. Baseball fans, this is Mel Allen. Hi, everybody. I'm Kurt Gowdy. Hi, everybody. I'm Vin Scully. Hey, and everybody, I'm Keith Jackson. And welcome to the World Series for 1981. For the first time in history, it will be played inside World Series where we fly the colors of two countries. Florida Marlins have made it to the World Series faster than any franchise in Major League history. It took 44 years, but the Subway Series is back. The first time since 1986 they get a chance to see their beloved Red Sox in a World Series. The St. Louis Cardinals are headed back to the World Series. It's no wonder then that this is our national pastime. Settle back and enjoy the ride. It's not easy to get there. It takes a lot of work, and it takes a lot of guys contributing. Have a good day. Come on. Something good is going to happen to you. This is one thing I think you go to spring training for, to work hard, to, to go and play in the World Series. I think every player's dream or goal is, is to play and win a World Series. You realize that, and then there were two left standing, and you're one of the two. As a kid, I dreamed that someday I would be playing the World Series. You're no longer that child that's sitting in front of the television set and watching the World Series. This is the moment I've been dreaming about. And here you are. I say to myself, thank you. My dream come true. It's the ultimate level, really. The two best teams for that year from the American National League. Uh, and you're part of it. You're part of history. And the world is watching. You know, it's scary, electrifying, it's wonderful. And uh, it's just different. One of those things that's kind of an out-of-body experience. I never knew how I was going to react if that opportunity came where I knew I'd have a chance to, to go to the World Series. You don't think about it. All you do is think about uh, getting the guy out. You don't think about the fans. You don't think about what it means. You don't think about the TV cameras. Enjoy it. You may not get in another one, and I didn't. In life, it was one of the goals that I set out to achieve, and I lived it. I just felt really good that day, and I told the guys, I said, guys, don't worry about it today. You got to jump on my back. I'm going to carry you today. Bucket Cook, we'll see you tomorrow night. If I was a Dodger fan, I would have been, ah, here comes Kurt. You know, I dreamed it up, and it happened. And why it happened, I can't tell you. The impossible has happened. The, the writers wanted to interview my glove and not me. Great play by Robinson. What a play. Colfax pitched the greatest game that I've ever seen pitched. Bob Gibson that day, he was untouchable, unbelievable. And we will never again see anyone come close to three complete game shutouts in a World Series. It won't be done. The one, two to Clemente. He swings the ball. Swing. What a player he was his whole career. And then to emphasize it with a World Series like he had was just fantastic. See ya! See ya! See ya! A home run by Derek Jeter! What he's been able to do has just been incredible. Derek Jeter's Mr. November! Reggie was always at his best when they turned the bright lights on. First pitch. Oh, what a blow! This is history. He's not called Mr. October for nothing. Being in the same company with Babe Ruhr and Reggie Jackson, it's unbelievable. Well, I was pretty nervous myself. It was quite a thrill. I'm glad it happened to me that day. Well, I wish I would have kept the ball. I gave him the ball. <laughs> and I can't tell who's going to come in. It is going to be Grover Cleveland Alexander. All people come on. The Gianfrido catch in 47 is frequently grouped with the Willie Mays catch in 54. I knew right away I was going to catch the ball. Hitting a home run in Chicago that time. The Lord was with me when I called the shots. I caught the whole Red Sox infield napping. Lazarowski has hit a 1-0 pitch over the left field fence to win the 1961. We beat him. We beat him. We beat the great Yankees. I know exactly where I was when Fisk hit that home run. If it stays fair, home run. I wonder if the foul pole didn't have that 
screen on the inside pole. What would have happened? I don't know. I was up on the railing and Brian Anderson was sitting next to me. Scotty hits the ball and he jumps up and just screams. Oh my God! And I just sitting there going, no way. No, no way. And then it went out. Matsui has his third home run in only 10 at bats in this World Series. Freeze leading it off. Freeze tied this game in the bottom of the ninth with a two run triple. Three ball, two strikeout. In the air to center. Has he done it? Way back. It is gone. Hello, game seven. People were crying, people were laughing, you know, people were hugging and uh, people were screaming. I mean, it had every emotion possible. We will see you tomorrow night. Trying to survive, it was just sheer luck. Little roller up along first, it gets through Buckner. Here comes Knight and the Mets win it. We won the game on a ground ball. Touch him all, Joe, you'll never hit a bigger home. And I'm thinking, why did not I learn to do cartwheels? greatest feeling in the world. If you happen to win, it's magnified that much greater. You know, they've often said, if, you, if you're going to lose, you better lose early. Because if you lose in the World Series, that's what's remembered the most. To go to the World Series, I mean, we took it as far as we could go. Unfortunately, we came out on the short end. I wouldn't trade that experience for anything. I can remember people saying, well, you know, you shouldn't feel so bad because at least you got there. Look at all the other teams that went home. Well, we didn't go there to lose because all of your dreams as a kid, you never lost. But if you don't win it, you know, I don't know what you feel. I don't know what the Red Sox felt. I don't think they were feeling too good. I, you, you've got to win it, you know. You know, planning is one thing, but, but you've got to take home that, that ring and that trophy. Winning, that's it. Knowing that you worked that hard for one reason, that's to win a championship and you're able to do it. Oh, World Series is a World Series no matter where you play. It's not another ball game. You just can't get any higher than that. Well, it was the fulfillment of a dream. Being able to run out on that mound when the last out is recorded and jump around and be world champions, it's the greatest feeling in the world. They're all Little League kids again. This is the dream come true. They're going to own a ring that says World Series champion. You know, whenever you're at the pinnacle of what you do, the sport that you play, you can't describe it until you go there. The chills that I get them still when I watch them, the introduction, the national anthem, it's, I think, the purest form of championship in any sport. Major League Baseball Productions presents the World Series, History of the Fall Classic. Through the latter part of the 19th century, Major League Baseball was becoming established as the national pastime, but only with a national league. With the turn of the century, however, came the advent of a competing league. The American League grew out of a high minor league called the Western League or Western Association, which was run by a gentleman named Ben Johnson to compete with the monopolistic National League. Major cities in the East and Midwest were granted teams in the American League in 1901 and were soon able to coax some stars away from the National League, like Knapp Lajue, the league's preeminent hitter, and Cy Young, the most accomplished pitcher of his era. 
the Sporting News strongly endorsed Johnson's new league, and fans flocked to the games. In just its second year, the American League outdrew its national counterpart by half a million fans. The league vaulted from a stepchild status into a full-blown league. Finally, in the American League's third season, the champions of the two leagues agreed to meet come October. It was, at first, simply a matter of challenge. The American League champions, Boston challenged Pittsburgh, the National League champions, and they agreed on a nine-game series. Ben Johnson gave the Boston team one injunction. You must beat them. And behind the pitching of Cy Young and Bill Deneen, who threw 69 of 71 innings between them, Boston did beat Hannes Wagner and the Pirates five games to three. There isn't much people remember today about the 1903 World Series, but what should be remembered is Boston defeated Pittsburgh, so it was the upstart American League beating the established National League. And in a lot of ways, that added credibility to the American League. So not only had the National League lost some of its best players to the American League, it had also lost the first official World Series. As such, there was a residue of bitterness, perhaps best exemplified by the owner of the New York Giants and their fiery manager, John McGraw. The next year, the National League champion, the New York Giants, McGraw's first pennant winner, had an owner who refused to accept the challenge from the upstart American League. This cancellation caused so much fuss that the same owner of the Giants, John Brush, then wrote up rules for how a World Series should be played, and those rules exist to this day. And so, in 1905, the World Series, as we now know it, finally got underway. In 1905, we saw really the first official World Series. It was the biggest sporting event in American history to that time. The two biggest cities in the country, Philadelphia and New York, the two most famous managers in baseball, Connie Mack of the Philadelphia Athletics, John McGraw of the Giants, and the two great pitchers, Matthewson and Gettysburg Eddie Plank, matched up in game one. Christy Matthewson was the first great superstar of the 20th century. Year in and year out, good pitching will win in the World Series. And really, that goes back to 1905. Matheson wins three shutouts, only one guy gets the third base. In fact, what Matthewson did in 1905 while leading the Giants to a four games to one victory may be the single greatest performance in World Series history. For in the course of six days, Christie threw three complete game shutouts, a feat that could never be equal today. The structure of the game no longer permits three consecutive complete game shutouts. Teams that get to the World Series will have it deep bullpens, they'll have outstanding closers, and we will never again see anyone come close to three complete game shutouts in a World Series. It won't be done. Still another feat many thought would never be duplicated took place in 1906, when the Chicago Cubs won a phenomenal 116 regular season games, a record unmatched for nearly a century. At that time, the Cubs were sort of what the New York Yankees represent today. They were perhaps the consistently best baseball team in the major leagues. The 1906 World Series was the first of three straight for the Cubs. It was also the first intra-city series, as the Crosstown White Sox upset the heavily favored Cubs four games to two. When the Cubs returned to the Fall Classic in 1907, they met Detroit and promptly became part of an historic series moment. Game one of the World Series in 1907 has that kind of romantic aura. The Cubs were down three to two in the bottom of the ninth, and then the Tiger catcher, Charlie Schmidt, dropped a third strike, which allowed a run to score, and the game was tied. It went on another three innings, was then called on account of darkness, as was common in that era. Cubs went on to win the next four games and sweep the series. It was pretty dramatic in your opening game of the series to, uh, to have a 12-inning tie. Call it Cubs karma if you like, but it continued to follow Chicago into the 1908 season as the team maintained its winning ways and its reputation as the best franchise in the game. 
1908 is the third year of what Cub fans would consider the best three-year period in the team's history, uh, three consecutive pennants, and you hear that team referred to as a Cubs dynasty. But they were in a nip and tuck, tremendous pennant race with McGraw's New York Giants. And that race took a turn on one bizarre play, one still known today as Merkel's boner. So what exactly was Fred's faux pas? His boner was that he did what everybody was doing at that time, two out, game-winning hit, scoring a man from third. Merkel's on first base. He didn't go all the way down to touch second base. Evers calls for the ball, steps on second base. The umpire calls Merkel out, and you have pandemonium because you've got hundreds of people on the field at this point. Instead of a 2-1 giant victory, it was a 1-1 tie, which had to be replayed at the end of the season because the teams finished with identical records and the Cubs won the playoff game and went on to the World Series. The Cubs once again faced the Tigers in that 1908 series and won the first two games to stretch their series winning streak to six. They'd win the series four games to one, but was it thanks to Merkel's boner or his curse? People who really know their early baseball think that maybe if the Cubs hadn't sort of stolen that pennant, they might not be a, a cursed ball club today. It's kind of funny to think about, but when maybe you're not the team that's supposed to be there, that could cast a little shadow on your history. The Tigers got another shot in 1909, riding Ty Cobb's third straight batting title to their third straight series. The 1909 World Series was the Pittsburgh Pirates versus the, the Detroit Tigers, but it was more than that. It was a pitting of the two great players, one the stalwart, the veteran, and one the upstarts from Detroit. The thing that's so amazing is the personality differences between Ty Cobb on the one hand, this fiery, fiery, temperamental player, and Honus Wagner, this immigrant son. Big, lumbering, noble, generous. With two of the game's marquee players center stage, the World Series went to a deciding Game 7 for the first time. As it turned out, Wagner outplayed Cobb in almost every respect. Wagner was a hero. He was one of the reasons that the Pirates won the World Series. He batted over 300, sparkled in the field, stole six bases in the seven-game series. Wagner helped the Pirates atone for their 1903 series defeat. As for Cobb, the most dominant player of his era, he would never again play in a World Series. In just its second decade, the World Series had become an American tradition. In 1910, the confident Philadelphia A's won their third American League pennant and were matched up in the series against the perennial powerhouse Chicago Cubs. In 1910, the Chicago Cubs are the class of the baseball world. They're facing the new champions of the American League, Philadelphia Athletics. The Athletics have a pitcher named Jack Combs. He wins three of the four games that Philadelphia wins. Coombs dominated on the mound, but the true genius behind the A's was their manager, Connie Mack, who cast a lasting image. He's standing on the dugout steps with a scorecard in his hand, moving his outfielders pitch by pitch and setting his infielders. What they now use with elaborate charts to show where every hit has gone, Connie had that all in his head. When the Athletics met the Giants in the 1911 World Series, they hadn't forgotten what happened six years prior. The A's uh, were smarting from their defeat in 1905 by the Giants, and the A's basically shut down the Giants' offense. Philadelphia captured its second straight series, thanks in part to the most valuable infield of the day. They have what is then called the $100,000 infield. $100,000 was supposed to be 
their value. The public imagination didn't go beyond the $100,000 in those days. They didn't yet think in millions. Before this series, A's third baseman Frank Baker had hit 11 home runs to lead the league. By the end of the series, he was officially known as Home Run Baker. McGraw had told the pitchers, whatever you do to Frank Baker, don't throw him anything up here. And McGuire in the second game of the series threw something up here and Baker hit it out of the park. Third game, Matheson's got it won. And bingo, he throws a high pitch to Baker and he hits it up into the polo grounds in the left field in that overhang. The polo grounds played host to still another world. rabid fans of the world. With fans like that behind them, how could Boston lose? Especially with their not-so-secret weapon. The Red Sox that year had a young, sensational pitcher named Smokey Joe Wood. Wood won 34 games that year and three more in the World Series to beat Christy Mathewson and earn a lucrative reward. Never forget the first check I ever got. We all got for 1912. $4,024.70 is our share, winner's share. In 1913, the Athletics again won the World Series, sending the Giants to their third straight series defeat. The A's pitching was really the story. They had two complete games by Eddie Plank and uh, two by Chief Bender, and uh, the Giants just couldn't do anything with these guys. The A's are just better. They are now the dominant team in baseball. They are what the Yankees later became. Those A's of Connie Mack are to baseball at that time. It seemed as if it would take a miracle to beat the powerful A's. And in 1914, Boston's National League team was more than happy to provide just that. The Boston Braves produce a miracle. They go from last place in July to winning the pennant handily over the Giants, and then sweep the A's in a four-game World Series. The improbable four-game sweep by the Miracle Braves brought a close to the reign of Connie Mack's A's. But Philadelphia remained in the picture. In 1915, future Hall of Famer Grover Cleveland Alexander won 31 games to lead the Philadelphia Phillies into the series against the Red Sox. Boston won in five games with a star-studded outfield of Tris Speaker, Harry Hooper, and Duffy Lewis. But the biggest name on hand was Woodrow Wilson. For this, marked a turning point. The president at the, the World Series, which is the nation's showcase of our game, baseball, uh, that means a lot. Uh, having the nation's leader throw out the first pitch, attend the ball game, uh, really put a stamp on the game, meaning this was a national venue beyond just a sporting event. Wilbert Robinson's Brooklyn Robins were the National League team in 1916, and making the first of his many World Series appearances was Casey Stengel. The mighty Red Sox were seeking their third World Series title in five years, and about to make a name for himself was a young Boston pitcher named Babe Ruth. Sherry Smith went the distance for Brooklyn in game two, matching the rising young Boston star pitch for pitch, but Ruth prevailed two to one in a 14 inning masterpiece that began an amazing World Series scoreless inning streak. It's been said that uh, he was the best left-handed pitcher in the league at the time, and uh, he was extremely proud of his pitching record. Behind Ruth, Boston won its second straight five game series. The National League entry in the 1917 World Series, once again, was John McGraw's Giants, this time facing the White Sox. This was a team of several shady characters, and we'll never know uh, what they were doing in 17, 18, 19. They were a very good, tough, 
and tough to beat team when they wanted to be. The White Sox beat the Giants that year, but they stumbled in 1918 and finished sixth. In turn, the Red Sox earned their fourth series berth of the decade, though under unusual circumstances. The season was cut short by World War I. There was a worker fight order, which made the baseball season end abruptly on Labor Day. It wound up as a World Series between the Red Sox and the Cubs. In that series, Ruth extended his World Series scoreless inning streak to a record 29 and two thirds, and Boston won for the fourth time in seven years. Red Sox fans never had it so good. If you're a baseball historian, it's no secret that the Red Sox were one of the dominant teams in the early years of the American League, certainly. And they won five of the first 15 World Series, which is pretty dominant, including three World Series in the teens when Babe Ruth was here. In 1919, the White Sox returned to the series and took on the Cincinnati Reds. The Reds had gone 96 and 44 that year, and that was eight more wins than Chicago. But most observers thought the Sox were a near lock to win the series. They went into that World Series very strong favorites. Although the odds started to change as the series approached, because word started to slip out that some of these players might not be trying their best, and indeed they weren't. First baseman Chick Gandel was the apparent ringleader of a plot to throw the series. As many as seven teammates were involved, the most important being Eddie Seacott and Lefty Williams, the team's two best pitchers. Gandel even managed to enlist one of the game's very best players in the scheme, the great shoeless Joe Jackson, although the extent of his involvement is still in dispute. When Seacott hit the first Reds batter of the series, it signaled that the fix was on. The performance of the Sox in losing game one was not very artful. The errors were blatant. This was an open secret among those who were in the know, players and writers. Many baseball writers in Chicago knew of the scandal, or at least suspected of the scandal that had occurred during the World Series. The Reds went on to win the series, and a year later, the owners chose Kennesaw Mountain Landis as the game's first commissioner. It would be his job to look into the fix and clean up baseball. Judge Landis issued his famous ruling that for any man who conspires or has guilty knowledge of a fixed ball game is gone. In the end, eight members of the team that would be known as the Black Sox were banned from baseball, including Shoeless Joe. The nadir, the worst moment of baseball has got to be the throwing of the series by the Black Stockings. because it embodies that priceless spirit of equality that is the very backbone of America itself. While the Black Sox scandal was a very dark chapter in baseball history, in 1920, the game was revived, and by a mere babe. Perhaps the perfect contrast to move attention away from the Black Sox and back on the field came this bigger-than-life player, Babe Ruth. What this converted pitcher did was hit home runs more than anyone before him, and his prowess captivated fans everywhere. So the whole era of baseball changed, and at the center of that was Babe Ruth, with that big bat, that explosive power, and that Ringling Brothers personality. And it came right at the edge of the White Sox scandal. It was the most fortuitous conjunction imaginable. But not even the powerful Ruth could do it alone. And in fact, he wasn't even part of the 1920 World Series. The American League was represented by the Cleveland Indians, a team that had persevered in the face of tragedy. 1920 was a very emotional season. Uh, near the end of the season, the Cleveland Indians shortstop Ray Chapman uh, passes away after an on-field accident. He was hit in the temple by a pitched ball, and he never recovered consciousness. 
The team rallied around this, and they had a great final month of the season. A late season call up filling in for Ray Chapman, Joe Sewell, went on a tear and eventually a Hall of Fame career. He was joined by Tris Speaker, one of the greatest center fielders ever, who as player manager led the Indians to the first World Series in franchise history. The 1920 series drew a lot of attention and fan interest in the outcome of each game between Cleveland and the Brooklyn Robins was evident in the streets. I think the people of Cleveland were so happy with their first pennant and the, the people in Brooklyn were the people of Brooklyn. I don't think they ever entertained the slightest doubt that these were good men and true. And the series, of course, was played completely above board and it was a memorable series. In fact, the Indians won the championship five games to two, but even that took a back seat to some World Series firsts, like Elmer Smith's Grand Slam, and a very peculiar play that involved three Robins and a then unheralded Cleveland infielder. Bill Wamsgans is the quintessential being in the right place at the right time guy. While a decent infielder, uh, we would never have heard of him today if it weren't for the fact that in the 1920 World Series, he got a line drive stepped on second and tagged the runner coming from first to second to create the only unassisted triple play in World Series history. Everybody who has steps on the field has a chance in the blink of an eye to live forever. Being the guy who performed the unassisted triple play really bothered him because he's quoted as saying that it was like I was born the day before and died the day after. Babe Ruth continued his offensive onslaught in 1921 and welcomed some old teammates thanks to the Yankees' new GM. Ed Barrow had been the manager of the Boston Red Sox in 1918, the last year they had won the World Series. When he came to the Yankees, everybody remembers that he recruited Babe Ruth. But the fact is that within three years, nearly half the Yankee team were former Red Sox. Barrow had simply raided the team, bought it retail and wholesale, and moved it to New York. The new additions helped the Yankees win three consecutive pennants and square off in all three World Series against John McGraw's Giants. The Giants were still a power, but McGraw was losing New York to Ruth and the Yankees. The Yankees outdrew the Giants in the polo grounds, and this just drove McGraw crazy. Ruth was hurt for part of the 21 series, and the Giants took the title. But when a healthy Ruth returned in the 22 Classic, McGraw devised a scheme to neutralize the Bay. McGraw told his pitchers to just pitch him in the dirt, that he was going to be swinging at anything. There's no question that Ruth is the greatest fastball and curveball hitter in the business. He could not hit slow stuff. He just couldn't hit it. The plan worked perfectly. And McGraw's Giants won their third World Series title. Though now twice a bridesmaid in New York, the Yankees had become the darlings of the city's fans, and the Giants' skipper had had enough. McGraw couldn't stand the Yankee popularity. He didn't like Babe Ruth, and so they asked the Yankees to leave. And so they built Yankee Stadium, and they did so just a stone's throw, literally, across the river from the Polo Grounds. It was in Yankee Stadium that the 23 series opened, but it was the Giants who won the game. Ironically, thanks to the efforts of a future Yankee manager. In the very first game, with two outs in the ninth, Casey Stengel, who was an outfielder for the Giants, hit a ball between the outfielders. Stengel flew around the bases for a go-ahead inside the park home run, and he had another eventual game winner in game three. But the Yankees did come back, and they won four of the next five games. It was the Yankees' first ever World Series title, even further obscuring their crosstown rivals. What gets lost in there is the performance of the Giants. I mean, the Giants were equally as successful. The Giants, I believe, get lost in the shadows. In 1924, those Giants won their fourth straight pennant, but once again were overshadowed in the series, this time by an aging pitcher known as the Big Train. Walter Johnson was by then acknowledged as the greatest pitcher of all time, pitching year after year for losing teams, setting fantastic totals. He won over 400 games. He pitched over 100 shutouts. He was it, but he was now at the end of his career. It looked like Johnson might end his career without having had that distinction. But Washington assembled a really good team behind Johnson. The Senators won the American League pennant. Now they get into the World Series against 
McGraw is Giants. This team had seven Hall of Famers and managed by John McGraw, regarded by many as the greatest manager in the history of the game. The mainstay of a second division team for almost his entire career, Johnson now was a sentimental favorite in his quest for World Series glory. Johnson, the grizzled veteran, was quite the figure of sympathy. Everybody wanted the Senators to win so that Johnson could win. It wasn't that there was a national consensus behind the Senators because Washington was our nation's capital. It was because Johnson was a popular figure. Well, Johnson lost the first two games he pitched, and this was regarded as a national tragedy. That Walter Johnson was going to be regarded as the GOAT. But the Senators weren't about to let that happen to the big train. They evened the series at three games apiece. And in game seven, Bucky Harris caught a break. He hits a hard grounder down third base that presumably hits a pebble and bounces over Freddie Lindstrom's head for a double that scores the tying run. Walter Johnson, who had been beaten badly two days before with one day's rest, came in and held this powerful New York Giants lineup scoreless for four innings. And then in the 12th inning, the same thing happens. Another drive down to third base, it's by legend the same pebble <laughs> and goes for the game winning hit. And lo and behold, the Senators have won the World Series. Washington went crazy. And after waiting all those years, Walter Johnson had the most glorious of all victories. The line that got circulated so much was, God just couldn't stand to see the big train lose another one. Johnson led the Senators to another World Series in 1925. But though he won two games in that classic, the Pittsburgh Pirates won game seven for their second title. The Yankees returned to the series in 1926 to face the St. Louis Cardinals, led by perhaps the greatest right-handed hitter ever, player manager Rogers Hornsby. The team would be bolstered by the acquisition of a castaway pitcher, a future Hall of Famer, more than happy to join the winning team in St. Louis. About mid-season, the Cubs asked waivers on Grover Cleveland Alexander, who was alcoholic, epileptic, but one of the greatest pitchers who ever lived. He had been a great pitcher. He has the same number of wins lifetime as Christy Matthewson, 373. Hornsby, though he hit Alexander well himself, knew that few others did. He said, I want him. I don't care whether he drinks or not. Alexander had a renaissance in the Cardinals' rotation and won game two of the series. With St. Louis facing elimination, he got the call again for game six. In the sixth game, he pitched a complete game victory to even the series at three to three. Game seven is started by Jesse Haynes. The bottom of the seventh, the Yankees load the bases two out, and Haynes can go no further. Haynes uh, will be relieved, and I can't tell who's going to come in. Lester Bell, the third baseman of the Cardinals, said there were younger men in the bullpen, fresher arms. That it was only one man we wanted to see coming out of there. Let's see who it's going to be. It is going to be Grover Cleveland Alexander. All people, come on. Alexander came out, and he told Hornsby how he's going to pitch to Lazari, hard-hitting young second baseman who was at the plate. I'm going to pitch the first one, fastball inside, and then I'm going to curve him low and away. One, two, three. And Hornsby said, no, you can't do that. You can't throw him a fastball. He's a fastball hitter. And Alexander said, if I put it where I want to put it, he's going to hit it foul if he hits it at all. And then Hornsby said, well, who the hell am I to tell you how to pitch? Hornsby returned to his position, and Alexander followed his plan, including, of course, an inside fastball that Lazeri pulled foul, and two outside curves that ensured his place in history. The pitch is one on it for strike three. All Pete comes in and strikes out, push him up Lazeri with the bases full. It's funny how many people think that was the end of the game, but it wasn't. The game ended oddly in the ninth. He gets down with two out, he gets the three and two on Babe Ruth. And he pitched him with such caution, he ended up walking him. And Ruth, for some reason, got it into his head to steal second base. The big guy takes off, tag is made, end of series, and for once, age triumphed over youth. It was the first title for St. Louis and the final flash of glory for Alexander. Of all the many games and innings that Alexander worked, he's remembered mostly for one at-bat. 
By now, Ruth had been a Yankee star for seven seasons. And though he continued to rewrite the record books, New York had won just one title. All that changed, however, in 1927, when the Yankees assembled a team for the ages. The 27 team is considered, you know, maybe the greatest baseball team of all time, and Ruth sits right in the middle of it. The Babe hit a record 60 home runs, defying all logic. When you have a guy who hits more home runs than most of the teams, well, that's a pretty special player. He was joined by first baseman Lou Gehrig, now entering his prime. Gehrig drove in 175 runs and won the MVP award. Gehrig had a fierce, combative spirit. When he went up there to hit, he had one purpose, to knock the hell out the ball. There were two great hitters, and it was a one-two punch. Ruth and Gehrig were complimented by Tony Lazeri, Earl Coombs, and Bob Musil. But in truth, they needed only one name. This rare assemblage of talent was called Murderer's Row. The 27 Yankees led the league in runs and home runs, but they were more than just offense. It was a great, great team. Plus, it was a team that had incredible depth on their pitching staff. The Yankee top pitches had the top three earned run averages in the league that year. So how can, how can you beat that combination? Heading into the World Series, the Yankees had already achieved legendary status. And even though the Pittsburgh Pirates fielded five future Hall of Famers of their own, it was apparent from the start that this would be no contest. When the Pittsburgh Pirates were sitting in the stands and watching all the ball go out of the park, it was Gary and Ruth. <laughs> I think it, it beat them right there. Following their batting practice barrage, the men of Murderer's Row, led by the Big Two, swept the Pirates, offering further proof of what many still believe today. Despite all the enormously talented Yankee teams down through the years, I would still select that as the greatest New York Yankee team of all time, and perhaps the best baseball team of all time. Still, the offensive show put on by Ruth and Gehrig in the 1928 series remains the benchmark by which all others are measured. In 28, Ruth had three home runs, all in the final game. But Gehrig had four, four home runs, four games. The two of them together hit well over 500. It was a four-game sweep over the Cardinals. With two straight titles now, the Yankees seem poised to carry their domination into the next decade. Boys, as uh, Babe Ruth has already uh, stated that the Yankees of the pennant uh, already won, I think feel that it's up to you boys to show him that he's all wrong. And the Philadelphia A's would do just that as the once struggling franchise returned to greatness thanks to the visionary skill of owner-manager Connie Mack. Mack gradually has been piecing together what will be the greatest of all the A's teams that in 1929 overtakes the Yankees. The Athletics were loaded with stars who stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with even the greatest Yankees teams. They were solid all around. They had Mickey Cochran catching in left field. They had Al Simmons, Jimmy Fox on first base. He was the strongest man I ever saw in baseball, I mean, as a hitter. He had arms like a blacksmith. They called Jimmy Fox the right-handed Babe Ruth, and he won four home run titles during his career. But the A's also had the most dominant pitcher of the era in Lefty Grove. He could get you out. I think he threw 200 miles an hour. Looked like a pea coat up there. You see it, you would see it. The A's were the new class of the league and entered October filled with confidence. Maybe we'll all have more to say after we play the Cubs. Philly met Joe McCarthy's Cubs in the 29 series with Grove the obvious choice to start game one. But the crafty Mac had a different plan. Mac studied that 1929 Chicago lineup, which was powerful. Hornsby, Kyla, Stevenson, Wilson, but they were all right-handed hitters. Emke was an old KG right-hander who threw a lot of slow curves, and Mack guessed that Emke would keep them off balance. And he did, allowing just one run while striking out a then World Series record 13 batters. Later in the series, the offense took over, 
in the fourth game of what turns out to be a five-game series. They beat the Cubs with a dramatic 10-run seventh inning and also wins the last game with a ninth inning rally to wrap it up. The A's would steamroll into the Fall Classic again the next year, bearing all the features of a dynasty. In 1930, they beat the St. Louis Cardinals in six games. Yes, sir. There goes Al Simmons with a four-bagger that gave a lot of St. Louis fans heart failure. In 1931, they won the pennant again, three in a row. They're acknowledged they are the class of the baseball world. The 31 series matched Philly and St. Louis once again, but this time the Cardinals had a little more seasoning. Pepper Martin was added to the team in 1931, coming off of the 1930 A's Cardinals World Series. So he's the new guy on the team, but uh, he's incredible. He batted 500, he stole five bases, and really was the difference in the seven game series. So the A's reign of glory was interrupted by a star who had arrived in the nick of time. Pepper Martin was exactly what the country needed in 1931. They needed a hero. We were in depression. It was an ugly time. It would also presage an ugly time for Connie Mack, forced to sell off many of his stars in the coming years, thus ending the A's dynasty. I was on the 1932 Yankees, the world's champions, and you can go back and check the records. The 1932 Yankees was better than the 1927 Yankees that everybody says is the greatest ball club. Go back and check the records. Well, both the 27 and 32 teams featured the one-two punch of Babe Ruth and Lou Gehrig. And though the spotlight still fell on the Babe, his career was winding down as he entered his 10th fall classic. I think I'm a pretty fortunate fella to get in my 10th World Series. I think that's going to be a record to stand for a long time. The 1932 Yankees were piloted by manager Joe McCarthy. And in the World Series, they faced the Chicago Cubs, a team McCarthy had led to the pennant in 1929, only to be fired a year later. So it's no surprise that there was animosity between the two teams. And it peaked in the fifth inning of game three, with the score tied at four. Was here a legendary tale was born as Ruth came to the plate. But I will say that I've had thrills before, something like uh, hitting a home run in Chicago that time. The Lord was with me when I called the shots. The called shot home run in game three of the 1932 World Series, the Yanks playing the Cubs, there's bad blood between the two teams. That resulted in a lot of bench jockeying, uh, primarily from the Cubs side, directed at Babe Ruth. Both clubs riding each other, doing everything to get each other's goat. Well, after this one particular time when I went to bat, Charlie Root was pitching. And the first pitch ball was a call strike. Well, I thought it was outside and didn't like it very much. So the boys that were there would give me this, on you, on you. Yelling from the Cub dugout was positively sulfurous. He was taking a lot of ribbon from the bench. And they called him, you know, big fat guy and slob and stuff like that. Well, the second pitch ball was another call strike. Well, I didn't like that one either, so I let it go by. I stepped out of the box, and by that time, they were over there going crazy. This is the furor. And here's a guy standing still in the middle of a net bat doing all this. And then he makes his famous gesture. And I looked out at center field, and I tore it. I said, I'm going to hit the next pitch ball right past the flagpole. He just holds up his hands. That, that's only two strikes. Well, the good Lord must have been with him. And it was only two strikes because the next one he hit out of sight. As he rounds the bases, he gestures again to the Cubs, pushing at them with both hands as to say, don't ever challenge me again like this, you know, because I'm Babe Ruth and I can do what I want. <laughs> and so he did. Did he do it? Well, you can add this home run to the long list of things these teams did not agree upon. Men on the field were later interviewed. The Yankee side of it followed the party line, said yes, of course, he was pointing out his home run. The Cub players just smiled and 
shook their heads and said, nonsense. Fact or fable, the Yankees won game three, swept the series, and took their fourth world championship. Ruth wasn't in the 33 series, but cheered on Joe Cronin's Senators. Joe, got to keep up the American League's good work now. I know you're going to have a tough time with those giants, but they can be four strikes to see Thanks, babe. Hit right. hopefully him like you hit <laughs> In addition to Cronin, Washington's 26-year-old player manager, the Senators featured feared hitters like Goose Goslin and Buddy Myers, a consistent 300 hitter. But they'd have to master New York's pitching tandem of Hal Schumacher and the great left-hander Carl Hubble. The two had combined for 17 shutouts during the regular season. Still, the decidedly young Cronin was confident of the Senators' chances in the World Series. You know it's going to be a real hard fight, and we're going to try our best to knock them off. Bill Terry was the new player manager of the Giants, having succeeded the legendary John McGraw a year prior. And Terry also put on a positive, if not emotional, game face. The Giants are a great ball club. They won the, won the pennant of the National League, and I believe that we'll beat Washington in the series. Terry's confidence was vindicated when Hubble dominated game one. He had a screwball that uh, he'd start off with one that would drop in for a strike, and you'd say to yourself, well, I can hit that, let him throw it again, and then the next one would explode. And then first thing you know, he had two strikes on you, and then he'd throw you another explosive. And we try to hit him, but we take our hats off to Hubble's particular pitch. Throughout the series, the Giants pitching staff proved too much to overcome. But a good deal of credit also has to go to slugger Mel Ott, who hit 389 and showcased his all-round talents. I hope I don't overuse the word uh, respect and admiration, but... He was a great ball player. He had that unusual batting stance where he would raise his right leg and plant it down and get position to hit that ball. And it's a lot of power and a good clutch hitter. When Ott came up with the score tied at three in the 10th inning of game five, New York was looking to close out the series. That's the smack by Mel Ott into the stands that knocked the Senators out of the series in the 10th inning of the final session. Four out of five games for the Giants. Hats off to the world's champ. In 1934, one brash team stood out. And here they are, the St. Louis Giant Killers, last-minute winners of the National League pennant. Now, I don't say we were the best club in 1934, but we thought we were the best. We were 25 that went together. And if anybody on the other club said anything about anybody, he had to lick all 25. That's the kind of a club we had. Hey, are those, are those Cardinals cocky here today? Here's uh, Rip Collins, Pep Martin, Jack Ruthrock. And are they playing some frisky ball? Frisky was one of the nicer things said about Frankie Frisch and the 34 Cardinals, called the Gas House Gang because of their rough and tumble style of play. The cards were led by the Dean brothers, pitchers Dizzy and Paul, who won 49 games between them that year. They'd face Mickey Cochran's Tigers in the 34 series. The Tigers featured their own solid ace in Schoolboy Row. Schoolboy Row meets the Dean brothers. Hello, Schoolboy. How are you? Just fine, Dizzy. How are you? Just fine, thanks. How are you, Paul? Fine. How are you, Schoolboy? Just fine. Blackie boy's got me in the middle. <laughs> But it was Dizzy who came out on top in the opener, going the distance and leading the Gas House Gang to an 8-3 victory. The irrepressible Dean continued to make his mark on the series in Game 4, but to the dismay of manager Frisch, he did so not with his arm, but with his head. Spud Davis got a base hit, and we're looking around for a pinch runner, and Diz just run right off the bench, and he went to first base. I said, Frisch must be crazy. His star pitcher running with all those guys sitting on the bench. And Frisch said, who the hell sent him over there? I said, not me. I thought you did. Well, the next hitter up hit a ball to Charlie Ganger, the double play ball. There's a wind up, and he cracks one, hop down to Gehringer, takes it across to Rogel. And Billy Rogel came across second base, got the ball from Charlie, to throw the double play ball, thinking that the runner, you know, with Digi Dean, think he's gonna slide. Rogel throws the ball, it bounds into the runner. 
all I know is Rogel hit him right there. When you should go down, Diz went up. I didn't know I hit him. I never saw him. I still get letters. People think I hit him on purpose. And to tell you the truth, I never saw him when I hit him. The ball bounced up in the air, you know, and Dizzy went down like he was shot. Dizzy Dean, who'd gone in to run, going into second. Rogel took the toss from Geringer. Then Fine turned into a double play, threw hard to first. It hit Dizzy Dean on the head and is lying now motionless. They rushed him to the hospital and everything. And of course, you know, the newspapers came out the next day that Dizzy's head was x-rayed and they found nothing. <laughs> that was always a punchline that ended up the story. But Dizzy did make a quick recovery, and the legend of Dizzy Dean grew only larger. Hard-nosed Hall of Famer Joe Ducky Medwick also had an impact on that series. Going into Game 7, Medwick had 10 hits and needed two to tie Pepper Martin's 1931 series mark. Joe, uh... You're within two of a World Series record. Do you think you'll break it today as far as hits are concerned? Well, Pub, I'll be trying my best. I, I only hope I can live up to that record that you did. So it's rather the series that you had, and I'm sure I will break it. Atta boy. With Commissioner Kennesaw Mountain Landis in attendance, Game 7 got underway, and Medwick and the Cardinals ran roughshod over Detroit, building a commanding lead. Then in the sixth inning, Medwick slammed a triple. And even though the game was well out of reach and the throw had not yet reached third, Ducky slid hard into the bag. And then all hell broke loose. Joe had tripled and he slid in the third base and Joe had a way of sliding with his right leg was underneath him and his left leg was up about knee high. And he caught Marvin on the shirt here and uh, I guess Marvin thought he was trying to cut him. And it was not intentional. It's the only way he knew how to slide. And uh, he didn't try to cut Owens or anything. And with that, well, Marvin took the ball and started after him. And he took a punch at Joe, and that was his first mistake. It's a good thing they stopped him, because Medwood would have probably injured Owen for life. And the war was on. The next battlefield turned out to be left field. But when Medwick took his position, the artillery came raining down. And then when Medwick took his place out in the field at the end of the inning, why you know, the fans out there were so discouraged and upset by that time. They'd all come out to the game early expecting the Tigers to win the seventh game. And they all brought their lunch with them and they started to throw it at Medwick in the field. They threw everything, bottles, and it was really a dangerous situation. So dangerous, in fact, that a decision had to be made by Commissioner Landis. The information, Judge Landis has ordered that Medwick be taken out of the game for a safety. All of the players are gathered up around the judge's box now. Judge Landis is talking to both Marvin Owen and Joe Medwick. He said to Frisch and Medwick, the best thing is for Joe to leave the game. And that was the best thing, and, and Medwick went. And so, one hit shy of tying the World Series record, Ducky was done. It was a, a bad display on the part of the baseball fans of Detroit, but I I can understand it. I felt if I'd have had something to throw at him, I'd have probably thrown it too. I was so upset. The Cardinals then wrapped up this emotional World Series behind the headstrong Dizzy Dean. Here's a pitch. A drive down the second which the Rocher takes. Bob is the first for the final out of the 1934 World Series. St. Louis Cardinals win this seventh and the batting game. A shutout for the great Dizzy Dean. That was a big disappointment because we had a better team than the Cardinals and we never got the recognition for it because they were A, won the World Series and B, they had a very colorful club. They were a good ball team, but I thought we were better. As it happened, the Tigers got a chance to prove how good a team they were in the very next World Series. And they went charging into that 1935 battle with an elite group of ball players. The G-Men. Tigers had Greenberg, Geringer, and Goslin, and they were known as Detroit's G-Men. This was quite a threesome. Detroit would face the Chicago Cubs, and in game two, the Tigers suffered a severe blow when Hank Greenberg, the American League MVP, suffered a broken wrist while sliding into home plate. We're gonna miss him, but we showed we could win without him. Indeed, for in the ninth inning of game six, Goose Goslin had a premonition 
about his 129th and final World Series at bat. Goose Goslin and I were sitting on the dugout steps in the last inning when we were all tied up with the Cubs, and Goose was the fourth hitter. And he turned around to me and he said, I have a feeling. He said, I have a feeling I'm going to be at bat with a winning run on base. And he said, if I am, he said, we're going to be the world champions. Goslin batting at the last half of the ninth inning. The ball game tied up three and three. Here's the pitch and a drive going out to right field for a hit. And here comes the throw to the plate. Here comes the run in. And the ball game is over. And the Detroit Tigers are the new champions of the world. When he came in after that hit, I ran out on the field. And Goose came toward me. And we threw our arms around each other. And all he said, what did I tell you? What did I tell you? What did I tell you? And that was a, a moment that I'll never forget. But the fans went absolutely wild. In Detroit that night, they literally upset streetcars. Detroit could not contain itself. The Tigers had given the city its first ever World Series championship. So when you talk about Detroit, just say the city of champs, because we really were. In the mid-1930s, a truly powerful team brought a winning tradition back to New York. The 36 to 39 crew doesn't get much attention. Yet it could be argued that this was the greatest of all Yankee contingents. Ruth was gone after the 34 season. It was now Lou Gehrig's team. But only for a nanosecond, because Joe DiMaggio came in in 36 and instantly made an impact. You added DiMaggio to that mix. I mean, just think of DiMaggio and Gehrig in the same lineup. This team couldn't lose. It began in 1936 against their crosstown rivals, the New York Giants, as the Yankees embarked on still another run of greatness. Bill, you made a remark to me yesterday in the Yankee Stadium when you were playing in, Lou or in Toledo and I was playing in Louisville. Little did we think that we were going to be here and uh, represent the New York clubs in the World Series. You're right, Matt. And I'll say one thing for you. You've done a great job as manager, and you've got a great ball club. But we are going to give you a battle. And may the best club win. Thanks, Bill, very much. Thank okay. you. There's only one question before this or any other house. It's what will Lou Gehrig do against Carl Hubble? Is the pitch mightier than the bat? Well, in 36, the bats of Gehrig and the rest of the Yankees prevail as the Bombers captured the crown four games to two. With a blossoming DiMaggio in the mix, the Yankees beat the Giants in a World Series rematch and then swept the Cubs in 38, three straight and counting for Jolton Joe. 1939 was probably in some ways Joe DiMaggio's best season. It was a year when he really dominated a winning team and a league in a way very few people ever have. DiMaggio would have to pick it up in 39, for this was the Yankees' first postseason since 1923 without Lou Gehrig. The Iron Horse had been diagnosed earlier in the year with the illness that now bears his name. And all he could do was watch as the Yankees went after an unprecedented fourth straight title against a very good Cincinnati team. Cincinnati was a wonderful ball club in 39. They had Hall of Famer. Ernie Lombardi was their great hitter. They had a very strong lineup. They had very good pitching. So they seemed to be a serious threat to this Yankee dominance. And of course, by now, after three World Series in a row, something that no other team in the history of baseball had ever done. It could be argued that this 1939 team was the most dominating team of the century. And in the World Series, they certainly proved it. DiMaggio and the Yankees beat up on the vaunted Reds pitching staff, winning the first three games. Then in game four, Charlie Keller and DiMaggio combined to create still another chapter in Yankees lore with the help of Reds catcher Ernie Lombardi. It all began with the Yankee Clipper. I believe I got a base hit to right field. Headlocked at four all, but in the Yankee 10th, Walters pitching again as DiMaggio, a single to right. Corsetti scores. Keller rounding third, lights out for home. And the ball's gone over Ival Goodman's back somehow. All the things happened in the World Series. And Goodman had thrown the ball home. And Lombardi was waiting for him, and Keller hit him. Instead of sliding, he went in standing up, and he hit Lombardi in the side of the head accidentally. 
and knocked him down and beside the plate and the ball went out of Lombardi's hand. While Lombardi was sort of sitting at the plate with a ball a little ways off his feet, DiMaggio came in. The time was I was getting so close to the plate, he had wakened and he grabbed the ball and put it right on top of home plate. And I was fortunate enough to put my foot right over the ball and tag the plate on the other side. And the feeling was that DiMaggio scored because Lombardi was not alert and aware enough to get the ball. And it was nicknamed by the media, which always does the labeling, the great snooze. Four straight World Series victories for the Yankees as they took their rightful place in big league history. The Yankees of 36 through 39, not only did they win the World Series each year, but they annihilated the opposition. They just rolled over. Four pennants, four world championships. They were a juggernaut. And now for the season's classic, the World Series, where champion meets champion for the highest honors in baseball. And in 1940, that honor once again went to the Cincinnati Reds, who returned this time to face the Detroit Tigers. The Reds showed no ill effects from their loss in 39, and even when trailing three games to two, went back to Cincinnati confident, with Bucky Walters and Paul Derringer set to start games six and seven. We felt as a team that uh, with our pitching, and particularly anchored by Walters and Derringer, that we would beat you. Walters dominated Detroit in game six with a five-hit shutout. And Derringer beat Bobo Newsom in the finale to bring the title back to Cincinnati after 21 years. The greatest thrill that I had out of baseball was winning the World Series in 1940 for Cincinnati. The people in Cincinnati so supported that ball club that you just wanted to do something for them. The 1941 World Series pitted the Brooklyn Dodgers against the New York Yankees, a rivalry that was to become famous but was not yet famous. The first ever meeting between the two teams featured three straight, tightly contested games, each decided by a run. The Dodgers lost two of the three, but led game four by four to three, heading into the ninth. And it looks like the Dodgers are gonna wrap the ball game up. They got you, Casey, who's almost unhittable, and he's facing Tommy Hendrick, and he has to get him out to end the ball game. Casey's got me three and two, two men out. And catcher Mickey Owen called for Casey's best pitch. And I gave the curveball sign, and he rolled off that big with it, and this one broke. It went choo. It turns out to be the sharpest breaking curveball that Hugh Casey has ever thrown. So as I'm going through, I'm trying to hold the ball bat up too late, but at the same time, I'm looking behind me, and there goes the ball. There are two strikes on Henry. The ball got past Mickey, and it didn't really surprise me. I mean, we were both fooled. Owens' pass ball gave the Yankees new life, and they proceeded to take full advantage. Joe DiMaggio singles to left. Charlie Keller rips one deep to right field. It's going to be up against the right field wall. It's going to be in there for extra bases. Scoring Henrik, and in comes Joe DiMaggio as the Yankees take the lead 5-4. Of course, the Yankees rally and win the game and then win the series the next day, four to one. So that one play, Tommy Hendricks' strikeout against Hugh Casey became one of those memorable World Series events. And it was the most emotional loss of a World Series ever. The Yankees now seemed unstoppable and in 1942 coasted into the World Series once again in search of their sixth championship in seven years. 
The Bombers were a perfect 8-0 in the series since 1927, a record unmatched by any other team. Now they faced a St. Louis squad that had finished the season an amazing 43-8 to pass the Dodgers and capture the National League pennant. The Cardinals were a team of young, aggressive, hustling players. Stan Musial, Lena Slaughter, a great pitcher by the name of Howard Paulette, Marty Marion, the great fielding shortstop, and got into the World Series against the Yankees. They were the best. The Yankees, for years and years and years, back in those days, the Yankees were baseball. And I think the feeling was that the Yankees were going to really give them a lesson and show them, you know, what baseball was all about. And this is another Yankee sweep, and uh, the Cardinals will be finished. Even though the Yankees probably had better talent than we did in that particular year, uh, we knew, knew they could not beat us because uh, we were very confident. But after losing the first game, the Cardinals were put to the test in game two, having seen a three to nothing lead disappear late. Bonina Slaughter came up huge in the bottom of the eighth, scoring the go-ahead run, and then gunning down Tuck Stainback to thwart a Yankees rally in the ninth. Enos was noted for that play because it did uh, turn the series around. The momentum swing helped the Cardinals win the next three games to beat the mighty Yankees in five. They dominated the Yankees, and all of a sudden, uh, when everybody looked up, the Cardinals had won this surprising World Series. But these were different times, and winning the World Series was not the only thing on Enos Slaughter's mind. Well, you know, beating the Yankees in the 42 World Series, that had to be a great thrill, but it was a sad one. I'd already enlisted in the Air Force, and when after the series played, I went in the Air Force for three years. By the end of the 1942 series, the United States was fully engaged in World War II. And like most young men at the time, Major League Baseball players answered the call to military duty. Well, some of the very greatest players went abroad. Lord knows how many games Bob Feller would have won if he hadn't spent all those years on shipboard. Hank Greenberg was one of the first, uh, one of the greatest stars of his time and one of the first to volunteer and go overseas. Ted Williams, of course, served in that war. But there was enough talent to, uh, to keep the game going. And so, too, did the World Series go on. The 43 Classic was, in fact, a rematch of 42. Minus, of course, some of the big stars. Rizzuto was gone, DiMaggio was gone, but the Cardinals uh, seemed not to lose as many players. Uh, Musial was still around, so that the Cardinals were a strong team, but maybe not as strong again as the Yankees were. Just like the year before, momentum swung in a snap as the Yankees scored five times in the eighth in game three to come back to win. And eventually, they took the series four games to one. No doubt the revenge factor played a part. The extra incentive, having lost in 42, wanting to come back emotionally and prove their dominance, and I think they certainly did. The 1944 series was the third straight for the Cardinals, and largely due to thinned out wartime rosters, they'd faced their intra-city rivals, the St. Louis Browns, a perennial second division team. The St. Louis Browns got to the World Series in 1944, and that just, it took a global conflict to bring that about. In St. Louis, a large part of the sentiment was with the long shot. It was amazing that the Browns had so many Brownie fans around. I could, they were rooting, rooting for the Browns. I guess they're rooting for the underdogs. But nothing could help the Browns at the plate, where they hit a paltry 183, losing to the Cardinals in six. And he struck him out. It's all over. And all the Cardinals come tearing out of the dugout. And the Cardinals take the World Series of 1944, four games to two. By 1945, some of the enlisted players had returned to their respective teams. Greenberg, for example, returned to the Tiger lineup in July of 45. Oh, you're talking about one of the greatest, an icon in baseball. When Hank came back, he, he just buoyed the spirits of all. Greenberg rejoined the team in midseason and led the Tigers to the 45 World Series where they faced the Cubs. His two home runs and seven RBIs helped Detroit win 
in seven games. Johnson swings on one, slaps it down to Skeeter Webb, tosses underhand to Mayo. And I rushed that ball, realizing at that time I was a member of the world championship baseball team, a dream come true. By 46, the Stars had returned, and the Cardinals battled hard to return to the World Series. The Cardinals, who had dominated in 42, 43, 44, were back in 46, but so were the Dodgers. On the final day of the season, the two finished in a dead heat. So it was a playoff for the pennant. The Cardinals won it. And their World Series opponents were the Boston Red Sox, making their first fall classic appearance since the days of Babe Ruth. To me, that was a real, real good, interesting World Series. I mean, and there was a case of their power against our pitching and speed. The centerpiece of Boston's powerful lineup was the great Ted Williams, but the splendid splinter had little luck in his only World Series appearance. We were pretty fortunate that we did hold Ted down uh, in his hitting, but he hit some balls awful hard. I was playing second base, and I was playing practically in the first base position when he hit. I can remember him hitting balls that me almost turned me over. People say Williams didn't hit anything. That's where averages are, are uh, really misleading because Williams hit some shots in that uh, series. Meanwhile, a good deal of the credit for the Cardinals' success in the series must go to Harry Brakeen, the left-hander threw complete game victories in games two and six, and that set up game seven. There, Enos Slaughter showcased his aggressive style in one of the most memorable plays in series history, the Mad Dash. Well, Eno was the type of player that hustled all the time. He'd give every ounce of his energy to win a ball game. But a great play requires more than just a great player. It needs a special moment. Well, you know, in the first game, I tripled. Mike Gonzalez, our coach, stopped me third on a bad relay, and we lost the ball game. So Eddie Dyer, the manager, he says, from now on, with two men out, and you think you've got a chance to score, you go ahead and gamble, and I'll be responsible. And that's what was in my mind on this play. It was the last game that day, the seventh game, and in the bottom of the eighth inning with Slaughter on base and two outs, well, the count was two balls and one strike, and he was stealing on the play when I hit the ball in left center field. I saw this little ball, it won't hit too hard, looped into left center. When I hit second, I says I can score. Enos kept running and took everybody by surprise because uh, we all thought that Gonzalez had his hands up to stop him. I never saw Mike Gonzalez, the third base coach, whether he tried to stop me, and I don't know. I never looked up. Enos kept running, and uh, that was a winning run. It was a great play. The Cardinals won their third title in five years, and life was good for a baseball fan in St. Louis. But casting a daunting shadow over the Redbirds and every other team in baseball were the New York Yankees, back in the World Series in 47, facing the Brooklyn Dodgers and their Rookie of the Year, Jackie Robinson. Robinson was a man on a mission. And he was really going to get into that series and show the Yankees how he could play. Jackie's presence and his aggressive play, especially on the bases, helped make the 47 series a classic. Every game seemed to be filled with incredible drama. There was almost the first no-hitter in the World Series, Bill Bevins. And with two out in the ninth inning, it's broken up by a pinch hit by Cookie Lavagetto, and Brooklyn wins the game miraculously. Seeing a near no-hitter in the World Series was about as rare as any sign of emotion from Joe DiMaggio. But that's what fans got to see when he just missed a dramatic home run late in game six. And DiMaggio got up. And DiMaggio hitting the ball. Gianfrido caught the ball bounced into a little iron fence outside the bullpen. When Gianfrido came down with the catch and leaned against the bullpen gate, exposing the ball for all to see, DiMaggio uncharacteristically kicked at the dirt around second. Although Joe D and the Yankees lost that game six, they won the series the next day. Their 11th in franchise history. Following this all New York series, there was almost an all Boston series in 48. But Cleveland beat the Red Sox in a one game playoff, thanks to player manager Lou Boudreaux's two home runs. He was coming off a great year, and Boudreaux was an inspirational type, and he was a, a fine leader. Behind Boudreaux and two victories from Cleveland ace Bob Lemon, 
The Indians topped the Boston Braves duo of Johnny Sane and Warren Spahn to win the World Series four games to two. And the 1948 World Series is all over and bring to an end another year of our great national game. was the capital of baseball, particularly in the 40s, and I think most particularly in the 50s. Imagine a world in which everything in New York City comes to a complete and utter halt when the World Series happens between two New York teams. Like the song says, it was New York, New York when it came to Major League Baseball between 1949 and 1956. A New York team won every World Series during those eight years and six of them were Subway Series. New York with three teams, they created this wonderful atmosphere and there was hardly a day in the summertime that one of those teams was not at home. And so many huge stars played in this golden New York era. Mays, Robinson, Snyder, DiMaggio, Berra, and Mantle, just to name a few. Of course, you always thought that the Yankees won the World Series. They were supposed to do that every year and they, they managed just about. So connected were the Yankees to the Fall Classic that when the Bombers finished third in 1948, they fired manager Bucky Harris and hired Casey Stengel to get them back to the postseason. And he did just that right away in 1949 when for the third time, the Yankees faced Brooklyn in the series. In game one, the teams were scoreless to the bottom of the ninth, and that's when Tommy Henrik came to bat. Tommy Henrik was... Uh quite a ball player. They call him old reliable. Newcomb had it. He hadn't walked a man all day long. He said it was a curveball. He didn't have a good curveball. And as I hit it and I went out to right field, I'm going down there. I don't know whether it's in or not, but I can see Carl Ferrillo's eyes go. I says, that's all. It's in the seats. The Yankees were back. The team's first ever World Series game ending home run set the tone and the Yankees won their 12th World Championship four games to one. They accomplished the feat despite the fact that Joe DiMaggio had played just 76 games that year, and the Yankee Clipper had a subpar World Series. I think I got two base hits out of the 18 times at bat. One was a little dribble of the third base, and one I hit as hard as I could and just got to the bleachers out in left field for a home run. And not only did the Yankee fans cheer for me, but also the Dodger fans. That's how revered Joe D was in New York. But there weren't too many cheers from Yankees opponents in the American League, as 1949 began a streak of five straight pennants for the Bombers. In 1950, they faced a team making its first World Series appearance since 1915, a scrappy bunch of young Philadelphia Phillies who were known as the Whiz Kids. There was a gentleman, a writer, who came up with that name. We were young. There were about uh, 14 of us that were 23 and younger on that ball club. So uh, he just came up with this name, Whiz Kids, and uh, it was something that people always associate with that club. One of the youngest teams ever to appear in the World Series, the Phillies fought the good fight against the favored Yankees. And even though the Yanks did sweep the series, it was a lot closer than it may have seemed. Well, the Yankees didn't exactly uh, clobber us in that World Series. The first game was 1-0, and the second one was 2-1, and the third game was 3-2. And in the fourth game, I believe it was 5-2, and that took away quite a bit of the uh, pleasure of, of having won a National League pennant. The Whiz Kids tumbled to fifth place in 1951, and the New York Giants advanced to the World Series for the first time since 1937 thanks to the shot heard round the world, Bobby Thompson's unforgettable home run. The Giants seemed to be a team of destiny, 
but they still had to beat the Yankees, whose heart and soul Joe DiMaggio was playing in his final fall classic. The Yankees beat the Giants and won Joe D his last ring, but the series was bittersweet because of what happened to promising 19-year-old rookie Mickey Mantle in game two. It was a ball hit between Joe and Mickey, and it was an easy fly ball that either of them could catch. And the next thing I knew that uh, Mickey was on the ground. I had to beckon to the bench to come out to the field to administer some first aid. And he wound up finally awakening, but he awakened with a burst of tears. And asked, I kept asking him, he's all right, but that's all he did was just cry through the pain that he might have had. It was an injury that would haunt Mantle throughout his Hall of Fame career. But in 1952, it was Mickey who led the Yankees into the series against Brooklyn. Mantle hit 345 in the Classic and helped the Yanks take a 4-2 lead into the bottom of the seventh of the seventh game at Ebbets Field. And that's when the Yankees' defense took over. They brought Bob Cazave in to pitch to me with the bases loaded and one out. I popped up to the infield. And then Jackie came up and he hit a pop fly to the first base side of pitcher's mound. The sun was going down, and it was a little hard to see from where Joe Collins, the first baseman, was playing. Joe Collins is nowhere near this baseball. The second baseman, Billy Martin, running from deep second base. It's a high pop-up. Who's going to get it? Here comes Billy Martin digging hard, and he makes the catch at the last second. It's identified as one of the great clutch defensive plays in the history of World Series baseball the biggest play of the series. It saves the game in the world championship for the Yankees as Kazava holds that 4-2 margin to the end. There was always a, a fatalism about it. The Dodgers were going to lose, the Yankees were going to win. This, this is the way the scripture had been penned. The eyes of the baseball world are fastened on New York, where it's the golden anniversary of the World Series. And a rematch. Unfortunately for the Dodgers, Billy Martin was still with the Yankees, only this time he did most of his damage with his bat. I remember Billy Martin that we didn't even take up in a meeting and he ended up getting more hits than anybody in the World Series. Martin up in the bottom half of the ninth and Martin laced one right up the middle, his 12th hit of the series making him the hero of heroes. Bomber scored and the Yanks won the game and the series. Yes sir, the Bombers did it again. Five World Series in a row for Casey Stengel and his American League whiz -bangs. They made baseball history. What a team. It took a record-breaking year to unseat these New York Yankees. And that's just what the Cleveland Indians had in 1954, winning an American League record 111 games while losing only 43. New York was still represented in the series, though, by the Giants, led by Willie Mays, their breakout star. The Say Hey Kid was as great in the field as he was at the plate, and in the eighth inning of game one at the Polo Grounds, he showed why. It's a tie ball game, and Larry's on second base and I'm on first. I knew that if a ball hit up the mill, there's no way I could throw Larry Dobert out at second, so I was playing very shadow. Wurtz hits this ball that looks like it's going to fall in there for three bases anyhow. There's a long drive, way back in center field, way back, back, it is. Oh, Willie Mays, Willie Mays, just brought this ground to his feet with a catch, which must have been an optical illusion to a lot of people. What made that play was his great throw. The runner's tagging in the second. That distance, if he, he misses him on the cutoff, he'll score. But he was right on. On the way in, I said to him, I said, I didn't think he was going to get to that one. He said, you kidding? He said, I had it all the way. <laughs> I said, you did, huh? You can tell that to, tell that to somebody else. <laughs> Willie's nearly unbelievable catch sparked the Giants, and they swept the heavily favored Indians to claim the world championship. For many New Yorkers, the baseball universe was finally righted in 1955, when the Yankees and Dodgers once again met in the Classic, with Brooklyn now 0-5 against the Yankees. Forget everybody else. The Yankees are the only people to play. They're the only ones that were beating us, for heaven's sake. We played good games against them. We didn't play bad ball games. In game one, the Dodgers trailed 6-4 in the eighth. And on third base was Jackie Robinson. 
Not content to wait for a hit to drive him in, the daring Robinson bolted for home and in a signature play slid in under Yogi Berra's tag. Stealing home is, you know, probably the toughest thing in baseball to do. Yogi and I said no, he was out. I know I had him. I, I wouldn't argue that much if I didn't think I had him. And uh, he was just playing out, that's <laughs> all I can tell you. I talked to Jackie about the call. He said he thought he was probably out, but uh, he was called safe, so that's all we go by. Either way, it wasn't enough as Brooklyn lost both games one and two. Still, the Dodgers hung in, and the series reached a dramatic game seven at Yankee Stadium. Brooklyn needing just that one more win for their first ever world championship. But the Dodgers' seventh game starter caught many off guard. I was coming off a year that was nine and ten, and if, I, if the Yankees beat me, they were supposed to beat me. Padre that day had good control. We finally got two men on in that one inning there when I come up. Yogi hit a line drive, sort of a line drive, down the left field line. I knew where Sandy Amoros was, and I probably should have moved him a little bit more with a left-handed pitcher. But when the ball was hit, I did not think that Sandy would get to it. And I said, oh my God, here it goes again. The only guy that could catch Yogi's ball would be a left-handed fielding outfielder, and Sandy could run. And he made one hell of a catch, and there went the Yankees. The amazing grab by Amaros preserved the Dodgers' lead and brought all of Brooklyn to a frenzy. Now, if only Padres could hold on. It's a tense struggle into the last of the night. Johnny Padres pitching brilliant ball. One out to go. Elston Howard grounds to short. Reese throws to Hodges. Brooklyn wins, and the Dodgers go wild as they mob pitcher Padres, who hurls Brooklyn to its first World Championship. We had a ticker tape parade all the way back to the Brooklyn Bridge. We went across the Brooklyn Bridge, and once we got into Brooklyn, people were just all over the street. I can remember the victory party in the hotel in Brooklyn, and thousands of people lining the streets behind their wooden sawhorses. People banging pots on the fire escape, car horns, church bells ringing. It was like the liberation of Paris, VJ Day, New Year's Eve, all rolled into one. So, Brooklyn finally had its first title, and Johnny Padres was named the first ever recipient of the official World Series MVP award. Just a year later, the two teams were back at it again in the Fall Classic, and with the series tied at two games apiece, another surprise starter, a guy who had started their game two loss, took the mound for the Yankees. Moose and I got to the ballpark early. Frankie Crossetti, the third base coach, was there. I went up to Frankie and I said, who's pitching today? He said, Larson. I said, oh, God, Larson. I knew I'd be in the bullpen, but I didn't think I'd start. And the way you knew you was pitching, there'd be a brand new ball in your shoe. So he got this locker and looked down there, and there was that ball, and he gave it a big gulp, you know. <laughs> that day, he, he threw everything over the plate. Anything I called for, he, he got it over. He never shook me off once the whole game. With two strikes on him, Jackie bounces the ball to the box and Larson tosses him out. I think I was the only guy that, that took the count three and two on him. Seventh inning, he came into the dugout, Larson did, and he sat next to Mickey. And he said to Mickey, he says, wouldn't it be something if I had pitched a no-hitter? Mickey says, shut the hell up, get away from me. It's a great superstition among ballplayers not to mention it. I just didn't use the word no-hitter. And I save that for my climactic moment at the end. Larson is ready, gets the sign. Two strikes, ball one, here comes the pitch. Strike three! A no-hitter of perfect game for Joe Larson. Yogi Berra runs out there, he leaps the Larson, and he's swarmed by his teammates. It's a great thrill. Uh, heck, this game's been played over 100 something years. There's never been a no-hitter in the World Series. And he pitched the perfect one. The Dodgers were able to force a game seven, but the Yankees proved too overpowering as the Bombers behind Yogi Berra's two home runs shut out the Dodgers at Ebbets Field and were crowned champions of New York and of baseball. That was a bleak day in Brooklyn, but it was not as bleak as the days that were coming because all of a sudden after 57, there were no more New York Giants and there were no more Brooklyn Dodgers. It was the end of an historic era in baseball history. True, the Yankees' winning tradition endured, 
and New York fans, many of them, continued to bask in their glory. But it was never again the same as the days when the Giants, Dodgers, and Yankees were all the toast of the town. of the baseball world are focused on the old familiar setting of Yankee Stadium. By 1957, it had become clear that rooting for the Yankees was a bit like rooting for U.S. Steel. The Yanks had monopolized the World Series, winning six of the previous eight. The Fall Classic had become a franchise trademark, and the Yankees knew it. It was almost a given that the Yankees were going to be in a World Series every year. It didn't seem like a World Series was a World Series without the Yankees. I was really lucky. I played with, uh, with the greatest teams in the world. We'd talk about it. We'd go to sign my contract. Even the general manager would say that when you're signing your contract. He would always say, well, now you know you'll get a World Series share. So while reaching the World Series in 1957 was nothing new for the Bronx Bombers, the Milwaukee Braves were charting new territory after Hank Aaron had clinched the pennant with a home run. The nucleus of that club was very young. We had never been through anything like a pennant chase before. And I felt like we were ready to go ride into the sunset and play whoever we needed to play, and that was the Yankees. But not all of his teammates shared Aaron's cavalier attitude, for these were the Yankees, and this was the World Series. For most of us, it was the first time to be in a World Series. And of course, going up against the Yankees, was even more mysterious. But the Braves had Lou Burdett on the mound. He won game two and then pitched a complete game shutout in game five. When the series reached the climactic seventh game, Lou kicked back thinking he'd watch his teammate Warren Spahn bring it home. I was scheduled to pitch the seventh game of that series and I came up with Asian flu and I was a sick son of a gun. So with Spawn bedridden, the Braves turned to Burdett, looking for his third series victory, but on a short turnaround. Can Burdett win again after only two days rest? All he did with the Mickey Mantle, Yogi Berra lineup of the Yankees was shut them out. Matthews makes a miraculous backhanded stab of the ball, and the Milwaukee Braves are the new world champions. We finally got to be the champions over the Yankees, which I consider the greatest feat whenever we beat the Yankees. Burdett is the man of the hour. No one pitcher ever before has beaten the Yankees three times in a World Series. Everybody jumped on me. You felt strong enough to hold them up, too. <laughs> it was, it's a great feeling. The defending champs returned to the series in 1958, and they again took on the Yankees. Having been through the pressure of a series, the Braves were confident that they could repeat. 58 was a great year for us, and we actually had a better team than we did in 57. We jump off through good pitching and pretty good hitting to a three games to one lead. The Braves are only one game away from a second consecutive world championship. But to some, the Braves' confidence had begun to resemble cockiness, as their two-star pitchers supposedly made some comments that the Yankees couldn't help but overhear. Warren Spahn and Luberdead popped off and they says they wish the Yankees were in a national league because we wouldn't come in fifth place. Whether those fighting words did it or not, the Yankees came storming back in the series. Bob Turley got things started with a shutout in game five. And then Turley came on to save game six. When the game seven starter, Don Larson, faltered, Turley was called upon once again. And much as Lou Burdett had done to his Yankees the year before, Turley shut the Braves down. And the Yankees completed the phenomenal comeback. Curly finishes a superlative job to play a part in each of these three Yankee victories in a row. But the Yankees didn't get a chance to repeat in 1959. As the go-go White Sox finally broke through to win the American League pennant, it was just the second time in the past 11 years that the Yankees didn't represent the American League. The White Sox had fought many years through the 50s, came in second, came in third, the Yankees were always there ahead of us, it seemed like. It's World Series time, but what a change of scenery for baseball's greatest drama. 
A change because the White Sox would face the Dodgers, who, though no strangers to the Fall Classic, were now representing the city of Los Angeles. And after each team won a game in Chicago, a World Series contest took place in California for the very first time. The scene shifts to Los Angeles, where much maligned Memorial Coliseum, called everything but a baseball park, is the center of attraction. As a kid, I used to go to the 4th of July to see fireworks in the Coliseum in Los Angeles, never dreaming that there'd be a World Series played there. The largest World Series crowd ever fills the huge Los Angeles Coliseum for the first World Series game ever played on the West Coast. All three games, we had 92,000 people in a football stadium, really. These massive crowds watched their Dodgers win two of three, then head back to Chicago, where they would eliminate the White Sox in game six. It was a big thrill to uh, win a World's Championship, the first World's Championship in Los Angeles. In 1960, the Yankees returned to the series from their one-year break. There, they met the Pirates, who'd been on a 33-year series hiatus. After that long await, Pittsburgh was one big party. But although the city was on fire, the Pirates tried to keep their cool, knowing they were facing no ordinary team. The Yankees were the world champions for years and years. We were definitely underdogs because we hadn't won anything for 30 years. The 1960 World Series, in my mind, really is one of the most historic because it was a feast and famine World Series. The Yankees would win by double digits. And the Yankees win it 10 to nothing. And then the next day, the Pirates would squeak out a win and the Pirates win three to two. The Yankees seemed to dominate them, but they couldn't put them away. In fact, the Yankees had outscored Pittsburgh 46 to 17 through the first six games, but somehow the Pirates had extended it to a deciding game seven. There in the top of the sixth, the Yankees took a 5-4 lead on Yogi Berra's home run, and then appeared to put the game out of reach with two more runs in the top of the eighth. But up by three in the bottom half of the eighth inning, the Yankees got a somewhat dubious lesson in home field advantage. I don't know who had the worst infield, Pittsburgh or St. Louis, but it was like playing on a rock pile. The ground ball of Tony Kubek, a double play, would have ended the inning. Swing the ground ball, hit right toward the shortstop. Oh, it hits the back of the face. It hit him in the face, and Kubek has been hurt, and all hands are safe. A bad, hot ground ball came up and hit him in the face. Groundskeeper at Forbes Field can't even rake the damn field, so the ball hits a pebble. A pebble? What is a pebble doing on the field in the middle of a major league ballpark? Bad luck then turned to bad baseball when Jim Coates failed to cover first on Roberto Clemente's grounder. Now the Pirates trailed by just one, and catcher Hal Smith made the Bombers pay with a three-run homer. Incredibly, Pittsburgh now took a two-run lead into the ninth. My idea was just to go back out on the field and get three outs and we're world champions. But it wouldn't be that easy. The Yankees got two in the top of the ninth and the game was tied at nine. We finally get the third out and I'm back in the dugout and I'm sitting in the dugout and I'm just wondering how in the world we're going to beat these Yankees. And then somebody yelled at me, hey, measure up. Swarovski will lead off in the last of the ninth. Going into that last inning, I was already thinking about the 10th inning, who was batting for us. I never thought about Bill Mazeroski. The only thing going through my mind is we beat him, we beat him. We beat the great Yankees. With the bitter taste of the 1960 series still lingering, the 1961 Yankees made a powerful push to return to the Fall Classic. Led by Roger Maris's 61 home runs, the Bombers as a team hit a record 240 regular season blasts, and they won 109 games to earn their shot at redemption. I think if you took that team and played the all-star team in either league that year, they'd have had a heck of a time trying to beat us. That was truly one of the greatest teams of all time. 
There was no team that was going to beat the, the 61 Yankees. That just wasn't going to happen. Of course, that's what they also said in 1960. And it's possible that the Cincinnati Reds used the Pirates as inspiration. But the Yankees quickly showed that this was a different year. Oh, I remember I was just a very young guy at that time. And I know that the big bad Yankees came in and kicked our tails four games to one. The Yankees didn't just dominate with their power. Whitey Ford pitched his third straight World Series shutout in game one and was less than three innings short of Babe Ruth's record of 29 and two thirds consecutive scoreless World Series innings. But before Ford took the mound for game four, he got a history lesson. I had no idea that Babe Ruth had ever pitched. Before the game uh, in Cincinnati, the fourth game, the writers said, well, you're going for the record today. And I had no idea what they were talking about. Now Ford is only one out away from a new record of consecutive World Series scoreless innings. Chacon grounds to Richardson, who throws him out. And that makes 30 straight scoreless innings. Whitey Ford, the little lefty with a big heart, has shattered one of Babe Ruth's most cherished records. People were applauding. I said, people won't usually applaud me in Cincinnati. Before leaving the game in the sixth inning with an injury, Ford extended his streak to 32 innings, and the Yankees won the title the next day in Cincinnati. Ford's streak would eventually end at 33 and two-thirds the next year as the Yankees returned to the series, this time to face Willie Mays and the Giants, who had to win a three-game playoff against the Dodgers to reach the Fall Classic. We had just came from L.A. where we won two out of three in a playoff. We come back into San Francisco having to play the next day. We land in San Francisco at 3 in the morning. We got home about 4 in the morning. Have to be in the ballpark at 9 in the morning. Mickey Mantle and Elston Howard of the Yankees seem confident. It's kind of funny the way you feel when you play the Yankees. I remember when I saw that team took the field, I said, wow. But if the Giants were intimidated by the pinstripes or exhausted by the playoff with the Dodgers, they never showed it. Back and forth, the two teams went, neither able to win two in a row through the first six games. Then, in the deciding seventh game, the Yankees had a 1-0 lead going to the bottom of the ninth. On the mound for New York was Ralph Terry, the guy who'd given up Bill Mazeroski's dramatic game-winning blast two years prior. And now, Mighty Willie Mays bats in the last of the ninth. Two out, Matty Alou on first. He hits the ball right down the first baseline, and Matty Alou running, and he could fly. And here I am standing at third base, and I think, oh, God, this game's tied. Fast fielding by Roger Maris prevents Alou from scoring the tying run. Roger Maris made a tremendous getting over there, cutting the ball off, a good relay. And then I threw it home. I got rid of the ball quick, and I threw it. It was on line. As it turned out, it bounced high, and so the runner possibly could have slid in there. The only way that you could have got Matty Alou, Roger would have to throw that ball all the way home and probably in the air. He had to stop. There's always been an argument. Could he have made it? He'd have never made it. So the Giants have runners at second and third with two outs. Willie McCovey, the batter. You got McCovey coming up. Now you got men on second, third, and two outs. That's when my knees start shaking. Understandably, because McCovey was one of the most feared sluggers in the game, but first base was open. Ralph Houghton goes out to the mound to talk with Ralph Terry, and I thought they were discussing as to whether or not he wanted to walk me. I had had a real good series against Terry. So Ralph Houghton says, look, we got first base open. They want to walk him. Ralph Terry said, no, I want to pitch to McCovey. Here's the pitch to Willie. Here's a liner straight to Richardson. The ball game is over and the World Series is over. Willie McCovey hit it like a bullet. When he hit the ball to Bobby, everything stopped. First of all, you think, oh, we're getting beat. We're getting beat. Oh, he caught it. The Yankees win one to nothing on a brilliant clutch effort by Ralph Terry, the hero of the 20th World Championship won by the New York Yankees. 1963 marked the eighth time the Yankees and Dodgers would meet in the series. It was also the 26th time Yankee Stadium would host the Fall Classic. As a baseball player, it was like no other stadium. The stands were so high, it was like being you know, at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. Whitey Ford and Sandy Koufax, two of baseball's greatest southpaws, will be the opposing pitchers in the opening game. It was pretty exciting to go into New York, pitch the first game of the World Series. This was something we were all looking forward to, Whitey Ford against Sandy Koufax, the best against the best. And you kind of thought the Yankees would prevail because that was their history. 
but Sandy Koufax took it to another level that day. Koufax begins the Yankee half of the inning by fanning two backs with a curveball. Bobby Richardson is next, and he strikes out on a whistling fastball. Tom Trash takes a strike and is called out. As a lifelong Yankee fan, I still stand in awe of Sandy Koufax. Mantle faces Koufax in the second inning and is called out on strike. And now Roger Maris steps up to try his luck. Maris swings and fans for Sandy's fifth straight strikeout. On that day, the best pitch I've ever seen. Absolutely the best stuff that I'd ever seen in the game of baseball. Wright swings and misses for strikeout number 15. And the Dodgers have a big 5-2 victory. After Koufax had set the tone of the series, the Dodgers pitching continued to shut the Yankees lineup down. There wasn't much action in the Los Angeles bullpen as the Dodgers held the Yanks to just one run total in games two and three. The outcome of the series seemed a mere formality as L.A. sent its ace to the mound for game four. The Dodgers win two to one and sweep the series in four straight. To go and beat the Yankees four in a row, that was the greatest feeling of them all. Never before in all their wonderful years have the Yankees lost four in a row in a World Series. Of course, that didn't stop them from trying, returning in 64 for the 18th time in 24 years. Although the Yankees were older and slower, they were still the preeminent team in the American League. This was their fifth consecutive pennant, and even though they'd lost to the Los Angeles Dodgers the year before, it was still playing against the New York Yankees, and you've got to understand how important that was. It's a World Series for St. Louis, and everyone converges on Bush Stadium. It was our first World Series for the Cardinals since 1946. You can imagine how excited the fans were in St. Louis, how excited our ball club was. And I can remember more than anything else the awesome presence of Mickey Mantle. By 1964, Mickey Mantle was already a baseball legend. But in the bottom of the ninth of game three, with both the game and the series tied at one, Mantle's status as a mythical baseball figure grew even more. As he came to the plate, against knuckleballing reliever Barney Schultz. In the dugout, Mickey Mantle was standing there. He was leading off in the ninth, and he said, I'm going to hit Barney Schultz right out of here. Hit it forever. I mean, forever. Hit it to New Jersey. Mantle has just broken a World Series record. Riding the wave, the Yankees jumped out to an early 3-0 lead in Game 4. But then, in the top of the sixth, with the bases loaded, the Cardinals' Kenny Boyer stepped to the plate, with his brother Cleet looking on from third base. Boyer smashes it deep to left field. It might be out of here. It is a home run. A grand slam. Truthfully, I was probably as happy as him. I can imagine how my mother felt. Ken Boyer's grand slam propelled St. Louis to victory, and now it was time for the Cardinals to turn loose their biggest weapon. In that series, they had a guy named Bob Gibson. <laughs> he was nasty. Gibson threw all 10 innings in a Game 5 St. Louis victory. After the Yankees evened the series, Gibson got the call again to pitch Game 7 in St. Louis on two days rest. All he did was throw another complete game and lead the Cardinals to the top of the baseball world. The Cardinals are the new world champions. Gibson, Boyer, and McCarver join in a big bear hug. Amidst the jubilation on the field in St. Louis, few could have guessed the secondary significance of this, the final game of the 1964 World Series. When the Cardinals beat the Yankees in 64, the Yanks were a damaged team, a damaged franchise. The last drop of greatness they had went into getting into the World Series. And 65 began the years of really being in the wilderness. 